At the end of the video, I'm going to show you one of the cool things that I've been doing to keep busy while I'm doing my social distancing. Trust me, it is cool. I've been asked to do a video about pandemic movies and I will do it next week, but not this week. This week, for my own mental health, I'm steering the channel in a different direction. The news and the changes to our world right now is messing with our heads. This is the most difficult time I've ever seen, and I'm several months older than Sputnik. So to keep our morale up and to help our community, here are the movies I'm using to cheer the hell up during this little apocalypse of ours. Kiss Me Kate, there's nothing not to love here. It's a Cole Porter musical based on a comedy by Shakespeare, adapted from the Broadway play by MGM, who at the time were making the best musicals in the world. This is one of my favourite go-to cheer myself up movies. It even has an Australian actor in it, but I'm going to leave that as homework for you to find for yourself. It's not like you've got anything else to do, right? The movie was also made in 3D, so if you get a Blu-ray player and have an old school 3D TV set, you can watch baritones and sopranos throw things at the screen. There's a joyousness to Kiss Me, Kate. The singing the dancing, the jokes, and these two mugs, Lippy and Slug, played by Keenan Wynn and James Whitmore. Brush up your Shakespeare. Start quoting him now. Singing gangsters are always cool. Just ask Marlon Brando. Luck be a lady tonight. Luck be a lady tonight. Plus you get to see some real genius at work. Bob Fosse danced with Carol Haney in this movie. It was the very first time that Fosse did his own choreography on film. And it's magic. It was groundbreaking at the time and it continues to be wonderful to this day. I also love the set designs here, particularly the stage sets. There's a Salvador Dali influence about them that really works well. And this movie never fails to brighten my day. And of course, I love the songs because I'm a big Cole Porter fan. Check out Kiss Me Kate. Check out some other musicals like Singing in the Rain, maybe, or It's Always Fair Weather if you want to dive a little more deeply. They're not everybody's cup of tea, but if you like good music and good wordplay, you can't go wrong with a 1940s, 50s, or even sometimes 1960s Hollywood musical. Amazon Women on the Moon is a sketch-based comedy directed by Joe Dante, Carl Gottlieb, Peter Horton, John Landis and Robert K. Weiss. It emulates the experience of watching a science fiction movie on late-night free-to-air television in the 1980s. The movies within the movies are great. The titular film is a pastiche of dumb old 1950s science fiction programmers like The Queen from Outer Space, Cat Women on the Moon and The Dumbest of the Dumb, Fire Maidens from Outer Space. You can check those ones out too. They're dumber than trickle-down economics, but they're not without their charms. Some of them you might find on Tubi.com, which is a free streaming service. Within Amazon Women on the Moon, you also get the piss take on 1930s Universal horror films, The Son of the Invisible Man, and it's a work of comic genius. It takes the very idea of the Invisible Man to its most obvious conclusion. The sets and actors are perfect, and Ed Begley Jr., well, let's just say he totally commits to the role. We also get TV commercials and infomercials that are at least as good in this movie as in its predecessor, Kentucky Fried Movie, which I will be watching soon. And stay after the credits because there's an extra bit at the end where there is a satire of 1930s hygiene movies starring, among other people, Mike Mazurki and Carrie Fisher. American absurdist comedies don't get much better than this. It's pop culture thrown against the wall to see what sticks. I then had to watch some Mel Brooks because um, I did watch Spaceballs. But it's really, for me at least, kind of Mel Brooks light. The jokes are a bit obvious. So I'm going back to the first movie he directed, which hit like a happy bomb of bad taste back in 1967. The producers, not to be confused with a musical remake, is unashamedly transgressive in its time. Max Bialystok, played by that wonderful larger-than-life actor Zero Mostel, is a down-on-his-heels theatrical producer who stoops little old ladies to get money for his plays and musicals. 
His new accountant, the shy Leo Bloom, played by Gene Wilder, and accidentally finds out that Max could make more money on a flop than he could on a hit, and off they go. They find the worst play ever, Springtime for Hitler. Springtime for Hitler. A gay romp with Adolf and Eva at Berchtesgarten. They find the campiest and worst director on Broadway, Roger DeBreeze, played by Christopher Hewitt. Ah, this is Bialystok and Bloom, I presume. And they open their show on Broadway. You gotta remember, this is 1967. Nobody had done comedy about Hitler since World War II was still happening. Mel Brooks took the leap. He was a guy who diffused landmines for the US Army during the Battle of the Bulge, so he's got every right to mock Hitler. And he gave us one of the funniest, grossest comedies of all time. I like John Morris's music and Brooks's great lyrics and the flamboyantly tasteless costumes. And there's an important message in this film too, that if you make bad taste bad enough, people will love it. And if you go with your heart, things will be okay. I love the producers, and it's a joy to rewatch it every couple of years. Penn Jillette from Penn and & Teller and Paul Provenza directed a movie about one single joke. It's a joke that can be told a billion different ways, all with the same punchline, which is the title of the movie. I'm a big fan of transgressive humour, and it doesn't get any more transgressive than this. You get a who's who of stand-up comedians at the time, including some who have since stepped on a rainbow, like George Carlin and Don Rickles, all telling their version of the aristocrats. Yes, it will gross you out and appall that cousin of yours that goes to Hillsong Church, but in the end, the movie celebrates creativity and comic invention, and we get to see some of the greatest storytellers of our era, delighting and nauseating each other with a very elastic but very specific joke. And for me at least, it's funny. From 1958 to 1992, Britain produced this series of comfortingly vulgar movies, which featured a large cast of actors in different roles, in different times and in different situations, all thrown together in silly saucy movies that don't bear close analysis in our current cultural climate, but which for me at least are good dumb fun. From Carry On Sergeant in 1958, when conscription was still a thing, to the really, really bad Carry On Columbus in 1992, the Carry On movies with that rolling cast of Sid James, Barbara Windsor, Hattie Jakes, Charles Hawtrey, Bernard Breslau, Kenneth Williams, and hundreds of others, charted the cultural changes in British society for 34 years. They are dated and silly and sexist at times, they're campy and awkward and cheaply made, but they embrace their own silliness, they mock pomposity, and if you look very closely, very often male privilege comes off second best. Women often get the upper hand in a carry-on movie. I wish carry-on movies were still around. I think we need a carry-on COVID-19 once this pandemic clears. It's good to have comfort movies and comfort series for us to watch and enjoy as mental circuit breakers in the confronting world around us. As someone with a little bit of age and perspective, here's some advice for what it's worth. We're going to get through this. Our ancestors fought and prevailed against mammoths, giant killer birds, ice ages and mammalian carnivores that make tigers look like ragdoll kittens. We prevailed because we're clever, agile, tool-using primates. We found out that we're at our best when we work together and communicate with each other and when we share. We can do this. We'll get through it. And here's the last thing I'm sharing, and I think it's cool anyway. While sitting around the man cave doing research for this video, I came up with an idea. Using only things in the man cave, I created photos for the covers of James Bond novels that never existed. I put them out on Facebook and my good friend Greg Tannehill in Canberra, which is 600 kilometres away, added text to the pictures. It's now an ongoing project that we're sharing. We'll be collaborating probably until this tide of shit pandemic subsides. I'm going to give you the pictures now and I hope you like them. If you did like them, please think about subscribing to the channel. Let me know what your comfort viewing is as well. I'm interested to see how other people spin with this, particularly other people of different ages than myself. Do the subscribe thing if you'd like to. Leave a comment, throw in a like as well, and maybe consider and maybe consider clicking the notification bell. I'm going to be back next week, and I'm going to do those pandemic movies for you. But in the meantime, look after yourselves. Watch some good movies. Watch some bad movies. Watch all kind of movies. Find something to keep yourself away from the blues. And I think you can do that. Take care of yourselves and I'll talk to you in a week.